Good morning. I'll be reading from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 1 through 18, NIV. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around and there was some, and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshai, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mel- M- 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 Meloa, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will be put to death. Any Jehu, I'm sorry, Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Love you too, brother. My question for you this morning, what are you doing here? This is the same question that God asked a prophet. Come on, turn to yourself. Don't let, turn to your neighbor, uh, turn to yourself and say, what am I doing here? Some of you know, some of you don't know. Some of you who know will get a new revelation today. Amen. Hopefully, the story that Dan so wonderfully read this morning is familiar to you. And at the same time, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit gives you a new revelation. Come on, say it with me. A new revelation, a new insight as we open up this story today. I know my brother already knows what he he is here for and what he's going to be doing. But by the end of today... God's going to give you a new revelation. 
A brand new revelation. A brand new revelation. Come on, receive it. Amen. And as God is about to give you a new revelation, all of you, but my brother especially, in the very first verse, we read, Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. I know I already asked you a question what you're doing here, but I have another question for you. Why did Ahab tell everything to this evil woman Jezebel? Didn't he, didn't he hear about the Jezebel spirit? Why would he reveal everything to Jezebel? Point number one, she was his wife. The, the husbands and wives, I hope you would speak. I hope you tell each other everything. Amen. I could have gone on a tangent right there, but I'm going to stop right there. I hope you have a conversation. I had a conversation with a couple the other day, and they said, Pastor, it's so hard to talk to each other. I said, speak to each other. Amen. Ahab and Jezebel were from the same kingdom. Amen. Come on, say it again. They were both from the same kingdom, and they were strategizing against Elijah. After all, they did suffer a major decline in their prophesying kingdom. Yes, there were prophets who were lying, prophesying. Okay, move, move on, move on. Okay, thank you. If I could explain the joke, it's not as funny anymore. Come on, Demetrius, help me out here. Thank you, sir. Now, when you go home, I want you to read 1 Kings 18. We just read 1 Kings 19. Go back one chapter and read the whole chapter because it is glorious. Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and tell me it is glorious. It is glorious. And one thing you will notice, that there is a separation of kingdoms. A separation of churches and state, if you may. There is a separation, and the separation is major. We all know whose kingdom wins. We read the last chapter in, in, Prover, uh, in Revelations. Amen? Whose kingdom wins? God's kingdom wins. So I want you to be part of the right kingdom, not an American kingdom, not an earthly kingdom, but God's kingdom. Come on, somebody. Amen. And listen, it is easy to rejoice when God is on your side. When God shows up and God shows up, and for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, when you go home, read 1 Kings 18. Amen. God shows up and God shows up, and it is easy to be on God's side. You want to serve a God that shows up. You want to serve a God that makes you famous. You want to serve a God that makes you rich. You want to serve a God that makes you popular until... Jezebel shows up. <clears throat> Jezebel shows up with intimidation and intimidating spirit. She brings a whole bunch of other spirits with her. Amen. You don't want to be friends with them. I'm just going to throw it out there for you. Okay. And can I be honest with you? Is that okay? You know I'm always honest with you. So when I ask you for permission to be honest, Honest, I ask you to, uh, for permission for me to pour out my heart. Is that okay? It's difficult to do anything when you are threatened. Anybody ever been threatened? And I, I don't care if it's violence, if it's, uh, if, uh, if it's a lawsuit, uh, poverty, whatever, okay? A spirit comes over. And it's a binding spirit. When you are threatened, a spirit of fear comes over you, and it brings with you a spirit of bondedness. You cannot move. Anybody ever been so scared you could not move? I have. What happens? You just had a victory yesterday, and today you are threatened. What do you do? Well, the first thing you should do, you ask, 
what am I doing here? Come on, turn ask, ask yourself, what am I doing here? Here's the thing about Jezebel. When she hears what Elijah has done to her prophet liars, she doesn't take that threat easily. What does she do? Well, verse number two tells us, Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like that one of them. Threats, intimidation is the work of the enemy. Amen. I'm going to say it one more time because this is deep theology. Threats and intimidation is the work of the enemy. By the way, if she really had the power or authority to do anything to Elijah, wouldn't she just send killers to kill him? You don't warn somebody if you can, if, if, if you can kill him, if you have the authority to kill him. The enemy, let me, I'm going to spiritualize it for you right here. The enemy sends threats and intimidation against you. You know why? Because he's got no authority. If he had any authority, he would have killed you by now. Yes, he would have. Come on, give God praise because you're still alive. You're still in this place. If the enemy had any authority, any power over you, he would have already done it. But praise be to God who gives us victory. Amen. At times, we allow the enemy to scare us. Pastor, I don't allow the enemy to scare me. Have you ever, have you ever had bad thoughts? Intimidating thoughts? Let me tell you, they have no authority over you, but they can influence you. And this, there is a common thread throughout the Bible, and I'm going to read it from Joshua 9, just because I love that verse so much, Okay. But there is a common thread throughout the Bible for every intimidation, every threat that comes against you. Ready? Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord, your God, will be with you wherever you go. Your God is with you. Come on, say it with me. My God is with me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. No threats. But Elijah, just like many of us, come on and say with me, just like many of us, Elijah, in verse number three, we read, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Listen, I don't care how fearless you may think you are. I know some of you have these huge muscles. Come on, Mike, show them off your big muscles. Come on, this. When you are threatened... The natural response is either to fight, attack, or flight. In either response, whether you fight or you flight, fight or flight, I want you to be fearless. I'm going to say with me, I will fear not. If somebody's swinging at you, what do you do? Duck, but do not be afraid. Amen. Somebody shoots a bullet at you, what do you do? Duck. And do not be afraid. I'm not going to get political on you today. Back to verse number three. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. When we're threatened, sometimes we leave our friends. How many know that names have a meaning? Your name has a meaning. My name has a meaning. The place, Beersheba, has a meaning. Anybody know what Beersheba means? I'm glad that you asked. Well of the oath or well of the promise. Sometimes we leave our, our friends at the, at the place of promise, church, and we go somewhere else. We go far deep into the desert to be all alone. Don't. Come on, turn to him and tell him, don't do that. Don't leave me. I need you. Come on, help me out. Listen, if you're not going to preach with me, I'm going to go sit down, okay? Be I'm going to go sit down. Because th 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 this needs to be in you, okay? 
Don't leave me. I need you. Come on, say it again. Don't leave me. I need you. Which brings us to the question, what are you doing here? I need you. Come on, somebody. Help me out here. I need you. And you need me. We need each other. When we are under a spiritual attack, what do we need? We need each other. Help me out. Thank you so much. We need each other. We need to go back to the place of oath and not leave our friends at a place of a promise, but pick up our friends at a place of promise and bring them back to the promise giver, the promise keeper, our God. Many times when we are threatened, we don't want to pull others into danger. We just want to be all alone. And the thing about those two responses, there's a danger. Come on, somebody say there's danger. Because the enemy wants you alone. The enemy wants you alone. Because when you are alone, all he needs to do is give you one thought, one thought, and let it rattle in your head. Have you ever taken an empty jar and put a little um, pebble in there or a little rock and shake it? That one little rock, one. It says, it says that you need two to, uh, to, uh, to tango, right? But you just need one little pebble, one little rock, one little intimidation thought, and rattle in an empty brain. I'm speaking about myself, okay? If the true fits, wear it. Amen. Praise God. Yeah. And let it rattle. And what happens? If you rattle it hard enough, you're going to break. That's why so, some people break under intimidation. That's why some people break under threats. It is dangerous to be alone. We need each other. I need you and you need me. I need you and you need me. People online, it is not good to be alone. You need us and we need you. Amen. Verse number four. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. I'm going to stop right there for just a second. Have you ever walked a couple of miles? I know Dan walks hundreds of miles on a daily basis. How many, how many, <laughs> sorry, how many miles do you walk on a daily basis? Oh, I, he's being very, very conservative. Listen, I see that man walk. He walks at least 10 miles a day. I'm, one day I'm going to buy you a, a, a watch that's going to track you. and You're going to wear it for one day, and you're going to see how much you walk. He walks a lot, okay? Just walk around our house, we put on a mile or two sometimes. A day's journey into the wilderness. Listen, he really wants to be alone. Listen, there's so much intimidation that sometimes we journey, we struggle, we go into a place, a dry place, a place without any water. Anybody know who, what water is representation of? Life, the Holy Spirit. We, it takes an effort to walk away. It takes an effort to walk away. Have you, anybody ever walk away from church by chance? Just me? Okay. Well, okay. So, uh, some of you being honest, okay? It takes an effort. The time that I'm supposed to be here, I'm doing something else. And yet, the first couple of weeks, I'm thinking, what are they thinking about me? Are they thinking about me? Amen. I'm speaking the truth. Some of you already know, okay? It takes an effort to walk away. And yet, Elijah walks a day's journey into the wilderness. He comes to a broom bush, sits under it, and prays that he may die. He says, I, ha I have had enough, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. When we are threatened, we remind God, God, I already had enough. How many have ever said that to God? I have fought enough. Oh, come on. This is, this is good. This is, 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 are you feeling already the process of healing already happening? Oh, good. Thank God, Jesus. God, you gave me this life. Others want to take it away. Why don't you just take it? I don't want my life. It's yours. You said, you, you said uh, my, my, that my life is yours. Would you just take my life anyways? I'm done. And at this point, Elijah is tired. 
Have you ever fought God so much that you fell asleep? Oh, okay. All right. We're getting some participation. Thank you, Jesus. All right. <laughs> when we fall asleep, this is also a dangerous time. I'm not going to spiritualize it too much for you, but you already know what's, what falling asleep spiritually means. Amen? When you're asleep, you're in your most vulnerable position. How many got woken up this morning? Okay. Some of you need to be woken up. Grab your neighbor and wake him up. Give him a little shove. Come on. Give him a little shove. Come, uh, come on. Par partic participate. Give him a little shove. There right, you go. Come on. Wake up. When you are asleep, you are defenseless. You may feel lost. You may feel alone. You may feel depressed. You may feel friendless. You may feel useless. Or you may feel needless. And so on and so forth. I think I hit all the major ones, didn't I? Oh, good. See, Elijah came from a place of victory where he saw God's power manifested. And he came to a place of wilderness, loneliness, depression, suicide. He just wanted to die. Anybody ever been there? Or just me? Oh. Let's just be, listen, if we can't be honest with each other in a, in, a, in a house of God, how can we be honest out there? Okay? There are times when I said, God, I've had enough. Take my life. I, I'm no better than Elijah. Remind God about Elijah. Amen. In a time when you're doubting, in a time when, when you're depressed, when you're de when, in a time when you're doubting God and his existence, God shows up. Come on, say, uh, say with me, God shows up. Have you ever been there? When you're feeling all alone and all of a sudden God shows up. Have you ever felt depressed and then God shows up? Have you ever be, uh, felt that nobody's on your side and all of a sudden God shows up? You know, even as, as a church, as, as Living Waters, see, we're in contact with many other Bible-believing, Christ-honoring, Holy Spirit-filled churches that are seeing healings, miracles, signs, and wonders like we're seeing here. But when I look at the news, when I look at Facebook, Instagram, I see other churches are right around us that have turned from God and biblical truth and biblical teaching. I see churches on their knees before Baal in a culture of transgenderism, LGBTQIA, abortion, socialism, commu communism, and other isms. And I feel alone at times. I don't know if you ever felt like that, but I have felt alone, like we're the only church left. And then I am reminded by God and by my friends that they're still with me. But if I was to go in that moment, if I was to go into the wilderness, in a time of depression, I would never be able to get out. But I'm so thankful that even though in those wilderness, God shows up. Come on, say with me. God shows up. At times I wonder if we are alone in this. Are we the only ones left? Is Living Waters the only church in New England that is seeing healings, miracles, signs, and wonders? Are we all alone? No, we are not alone. And here's the worst part of being in the wilderness. The feeling of being alone. We're not alone. Come on, say it with me. We're not alone. But sometimes I feel alone. Sometimes feeling like the journey is just too much. But how many know that feelings are deceiving? Help me out. How many know the feelings are deceiving? Okay. Here's some truth from Jeremiah 79. The heart is as deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? When I'm feeling, I need to check my feelings against 
the word of God. Amen? Because if what I'm feeling goes against the word of God, what I'm feeling is false. When I'm feeling, when, I'm, when my thought life is under attack, I'm so glad that God shows up. Come on, help me out here. God shows up. In verse number five in our, in our story this morning, God shows up. At once, the angel touched him. Come on, t- touch your neighbor. There's something special about a touch. If, there's an, if somebody in front of you, touch them in front of you. Come on. touch. Them. They, you, they need a physical touch. Not a slap, a touch. We'll talk about that later. I don't know how I'm going to do this next part, but it's right up there, okay? Talk about breakfast in bed. Here, get up. Get up and eat. Have you ever been so tired that you're hungry and hangry, angry and hungry, and you just wish somebody would just give you a piece of bread? Listen, at times I wake up hungry. Anybody else? Middle of the night? That's not a good time to go to the refrigerator, by the way, okay? Just throwing it out there, okay? (laughs) Wait until breakfast. (laughs) You heard that, right? That's his favorite light in the house. God sends the best chef to Elijah. He sends him the greatest cook. He says, get up and eat. He looks around, verse 6, he looks around, there's some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. Listen, in the the wilderness, there's nothing. Come on, turn to your mouth, there's nothing. Not a thing. But God. Come on, help me out here. But God. God prepares a table in the presence of of the wilderness. I know you want to say enemies. In the wilderness. It's my sermon. I preach it how I want to, okay? This is the way God gave it to me. This is what I'm going to give it to you, okay? There is nothing better than being fed by God. And isn't it just like God? God refreshes us. Anybody else? Just me? God refreshes us. And when, we're, when we are refreshed, God did something for me, you know, saying, God, thank you. I'm going back my way. Just like that. He ate and he drank and he went back to his own ways. God, I want to die. God, I don't want to live. God just healed you, delivered you, set you free, and you're going back to your ways. But God. Come and turn to him and tell him, but God. Verse number seven. The angel of the Lord came back a second time. Listen, his, his promise was, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Therefore, if he's got to make a second uh, time to, uh, to visit you, what is he going to do? He's going to visit you again. Why? Because that is just like God, okay? Because my God, Demetrius, I don't know if you know this or not, but my God is a God of second chances. I know you got a poem on that. At least, amen. How many have more than a second chance? Oh, I've had a couple of chances. And sometimes we go back and we just need God to wake us up again. Amen. Oh, feeling good about this one. I just love how God encourages me sometimes. Because the journey that's ahead is going to be rough. 40 days and 40 nights. And, you know, uh, Dan here just admitted that he walks at least 10 miles a day. How many of us would walk 40 days and 40 nights to go meet with God? Okay, some of us. How many are lying? All of us. (laughs) Okay. Listen, 40 days and 40 nights seem like an easy ordeal. Let's go one, one day without food. Let's go one day fasting without food. How many could do it? I've done it. I've done a week. 
I've done Daniel's fast for 21 days. I've done other fasts, but 40 days and 40 nights walking, going to God's mountain, Mount Horeb, now that's, that is some dedication. Amen. Verse number eight. So he, he got up, ate, and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Now, that's some superfood. Imagine eating once and traveling for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen, in reality, 40 days and 40 nights without food is hard as it is. But traveling, now that's an additional strain on your body. Dan, how much do you eat if you travel, if you, if you walk a lot? You eat more? Yes, the answer is yes. I'm not picking on you. I'm just making a point. Now, imagine fasting and traveling for 40 days and 40 nights. Dedication. Come on, somebody. Dedication. But also the superfood of heaven. Superfood of heaven. Amen. Which brings us to verse number 9 and... And the focus of the sermon for today. Then the Lord, then the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? Come and ask your ask your neighbor, what are you doing here? Ask your neighbor. Neighbors, what are you doing here? Some more neighbors, what are you doing here? Neighbors, what are you doing here? So my neighbors, what are you doing here? People are like, what are you doing here? All of your answers are right, by the way. But God is asking a question, a rhetorical question, kind of like the one we ask our kids. Did you clean your room? Probably not. Did you take out the trash? Probably not. Wives, you know how you ask your husbands, have you done that yet? Probably not. We're going to leave that right there. Okay. Sometimes God is asking a rhetorical question. God already knows the answer. Come on. God knows the answer. So all of your answers were correct, but now I want you to close your eyes. I'm asking you on behalf of God, what are you doing here? Don't give me an answer. I want you to think about this. What are you doing here? You did not travel 40 days and 40 nights without food to get here. Some of you walked. Some of you had a five-minute ride. I know some of you came as far as 20 minutes away. Elijah went to the mountain of God to meet with God. But his heart was not there to meet with God. His heart was there to complain to God. And let me tell you, keep your eyes closed, keep your eyes closed. God is okay with your complaining. God is okay with your complaining. Open up your eyes and turn to uh, verse number 10 with me. I have been very zealous for the Lord Almighty. I have come to meet with you, God. This is where I am refreshed. This is where I worship. This is where I need to be. See, we know where we need to be. We know what we need to do. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. This is where he's complaining, God, the world sucks. I'm being honest with you. The democracy is broken. This is the truth. I'm not making this stuff up. Look, look at the news. This is exactly what Elijah is saying. There was an assassination attempt. 
See, God knows, and Elijah, as he's speaking to God, he is pouring out his heart, and God can take it. Come on, say it with me. God can take it. The churches around us, God, are no longer serving you. They're preaching a false gospel. God's okay with that. He knows. Pour it out on him. I am the only one left. God, there's no one righteous like me. Did you miss that? This is exactly what he's saying. Do you, you see it now? I'm the only one left. God, I'm the, I'm the best one that you got. It's me or nobody, God. I am the one. I'm, I'm your man, God. Use me. You see it now? It's, it's right there in your text. I don't know if you see it or not. It's a heart issue. And God, I'm, I, uh, there's no one righteous like me, God. And they're trying to kill me too. And if they take out this righteous one, what, what's going to happen? If they, if they shut down this church, who's going to preach your word? See, God knows the, the hurts that we carry. Yet he's willing to meet with us. He's willing to listen to us. He's, li he's willing to call us out. And God says, Elijah, I heard you. Anybody ever complain to God for like hours? Mm -hmm. How many know that God heard you? Okay. And then God calls Elijah out. He says, Elijah, this is verse, verse 11. Elijah, I know you came to the mountain to meet with me. Elijah, I know you came to church to meet with me. You praise me and worship me, receive love, re, re, receive rejuvenation. I know you, I know all that, I know, but Elijah, would you come and stand in my presence? Because I'm about to move. Elijah, stand like a man because I am about to move. Elijah, I know you're depressed, but I still love you. Elijah, I know where you are. I know everything. I am God Almighty. What do you think? Who do you think created you? Who do you think gave you the thoughts to come to the mountain? Who gave you the thoughts to come to church this morning? It is God himself. Amen. Now, Elijah, come and stand in my presence. How many have ever been in God's presence? Okay, some of us, not all of us, but that's okay. You'll be in God's presence in a second, ready? It wasn't nearly half a full battery when I started. It was three quarters. But even now it says three quarters, so it's all right. It was God's presence. I told you about to experience God's presence. How many of you experienced God's presence? Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. Anybody likes it loud? Anybody like it loud? Sometimes, I like it loud. I don't know if you know this or not. Sing a little louder. I've been in services where the decibel meter is off the charts. I was in one a couple of weeks back. Uh, it shook the place. It was wonderful. You felt the power. The Lord was there. Just let you know, the Lord was there, okay? But sometimes we want to experience something that we've experienced way back when. Back in my day, 
Listen, I grew up in a uh, in a Pentecostal church where they where they uh, used to say that back in my day we were on the uh, on our knees for hours and the presence of God would hit us. That's great. I'm glad. How about today? Back in my day, this happened. Back in my day, it was loud, but God was not in that wind. After the wind and earthquake, listen. When I was at the, at the conference a couple of weeks back, at a youth conference, mind you, um, what, was it KB? Yeah. When KB came out to sing, and some of you have no idea who KB is, okay? Google KB, okay? Uh, it's, it's, he, he, he's, he's, he's the one that got, uh, the, the youth are listening to now, and great, great worshiper. But the, it shook the place. That bass... I don't know if, if there's any bass in, in the musicals that you do, but that bass would shake. It would rattle some bones, okay? Uh, you know, we sing a song that I hear the bo uh, bones rattling. When, I, when, when, that, when KB's bass was, uh, uh, was shaking the place, my bones were rattling, okay? I came alive. I don't know if you could tell that or not, okay? We want to remember something that happened way back when in my day. But God was not in that earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire. How many of you remember back in the 80s and 90s when the fire of God fell? Okay. How many want that same fire to fall again? It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It was back in my day. We can remember, and that's okay to remember. See, God is showing Elijah everything that he has experienced and in every single experience that he had experienced God. But I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going someplace, so go with me, please. I am not against the fire of God falling. I'm not against, I'm not against KB uh, rattling my bones. I love it. I'm not against loudness. I'm not against those things. But when everything is stripped away, when all the noise, all the fluff is stripped away, and after that came a gentle whisper. When, verse number 12, thir thir uh, verse 13, please. When Elijah heard it, he put his cloak over his face. Why did Elijah put a cloak over his face? He experienced the earthquake. He experienced the fire. He experienced the wind. He experienced those things in the past. Why did he put a cloak over his face when God started to whisper? Reverence. The presence of God became real to him again when he stood in God's presence. And God asked Elijah the same question I've been asking you all day. Ready for this? What are you doing here? Listen, I'm here to experience God. God says, quiet. Everything just needs to be quiet. Everything just needs to be silent. What are you doing here? I want, Elijah, I want to talk to you. I want to hear all, your, all of your griping. I want to hear all, your, all your complaining. But Elijah, I want you to understand that in my presence, there's something special. There's something different than just some loud music, some, some fire, some demonstrations, some healing, healing miracles, signs and wonders. In my presence, all those things happen. But sometimes I just need to talk to you. Elijah, what are you doing here? See, many times we think we need all those things in order to experience God. We need all those, all that extra fluff to experience God's presence. And listen, I'm not against the keyboard, the drums, the guitar, the lights. The camera, the action, I'm not against those things. However, all those things will not 
fulfill us. All those things are great. Listen, I'm grateful that we have a worship team. I'm grateful that we have a production team. I am grateful. But all that fluff that excites us is nothing compared to the whisper of God. Listen, we're, 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 we're just about a month away, a little over a month away from Vacation Bible School. And there's going to be a lot of lights. There's going to be a lot of fluff. There's going to be a lot of action. Amen. But in all of that, we want the children to experience the whisper of God. When everything is stripped away, when the music is done, there is a gentle voice, a gentle whisper. And it's all to bring Elijah to a reality. Elijah, what are you doing here? Go ahead, brother. That's it. At the end of Ecclesiastes, when, uh, when Solomon had all that fluff, at the end he, he writes, at the end, it, what you have done is between just with you and God. That's it. When everything is stripped away, when all the fame, Solomon, when all the loudness, talent, anointing, when all that is taken away, what's left? A gentle whisper. What are you doing here? And this gentle whisper is still asking us that same question what are you doing here? And here's a few proper responses to the question of what are you doing here. First thing, be honest with God. Come on, say with me. I'm going to be honest with God. God, I'm not sure what you're doing here. I'm not sure what I'm doing here. One thing that I am sure that I am scared and lost without you. This is the response that Elijah gives back to God. When you go home, you can read it. You will see it. Can I have my uh, piano player up, please? You will see these things. You will see that Elijah says, God, I just need you. There's a lot going on, God, but all I need is you. All I need is you, God. Because without you, I have nothing. I'm nothing without you. God, I am seeking your presence. Elijah, what are you doing here? I am seeking your presence. God, I have traveled 40 days and 40 nights to find you. God, I will go further. God, I will do whatever it takes to get into your presence. Come on, say it with me. God, I will do anything to get into your presence. God, I will be seeking your presence with all that I am. God, I want nothing but you. Now, Lord, help me to seek your presence earnestly. Especially in times of distress. Especially when confusion comes. <clears throat> when one of those pebbles gets in my empty brain and it starts rattling. God, help me to find peace and joy in your presence. God, I want to hear your voice. Father, would you make my ears in tune with what you're saying? I want to hear that still small voice in the midst of noise of life. In the midst of noise that I create at times, in the midst of memories of your moves in the past, God help me to recognize and follow your gentle whisper. As I come to a close, I want to encourage you. I don't know how you came in. I don't know if there's depression on you. I don't know if there's any fear on you. I don't know what burden you are carrying this morning. 
one thing that I do know is that God is a God of encouragement. And with the encouragement that you're about to receive, He's going to feed you and nourish you to run and meet with Him. He's going to encourage you to run to the mountain of God. And before I do that, what are you doing here? See, God is asking questions because He wants to hear from you. Go ahead and start speaking to Him. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to do any of that. I want you to be relaxed and just focusing on God right now. Start listening. He's changing some things in your life. He's changing your situation. After all, He is a faithful God. I'm not going to let you go until you hear the, the most important thing. God wants to rejuvenate your purpose. He wants to give you a renewed purpose. Just like Elijah, he received the word from the Lord. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you, are, when you go there, anoint Hezio king of Aram. Also, anoint Jehu son of Nimshi, king of over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hezio. And Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet, I reserved seven thousand in Israel all whose knees have not bowed to Baal whose mouth have not kissed him I know most of us don't feel anywhere close to Elijah or his anointing however God wants to give you a renewed purpose would you join me in prayer you can you can continue sitting I just want you to join me in in, in, in prayer father renew and reveal your purpose for my life renew my strength give me clarity to fulfill the mission you have for me now as you're listening to God's whispers to some of you he'll tell you to encourage others in this in despair to some of you, he'll, he'll tell you to empower others. To some of you, he'll tell you to lead others to Jesus. And to some of us, he'll say, pass on the mission to others. We're not alone. Come on, say it with me, I am not alone. God has many more like us here in New England and throughout the United States of America and the world. There's many more believers that we know. There, there are more believers than we know because God is faithful. Now with your renewed purpose, your renewed vision, go serve your king. Amen.